Welcome everybody, welcome to a blaze. Is everybody a blaze and blazing with the Holy Spirit? I sure am, I'm a nervous wreck up here. I want to thank all of you for coming out today. Uh, first of all, before I do anything else, I'm the third speaker here and the first parishioner to speak and I think that's quite a blessing. So on behalf of all the parishioners, I'd sure like to thank the committee and I'm going to embarrass them right away and have you guys all stand. Let's give them a round of applause. This takes a lot of time. A lot of work, a lot of effort. Okay, that's enough. I only got 20 minutes and we're running over now. Okay. You know, I was with uh, Father Michael at IHOP back in June, and we're sitting over, and I'm eating my blueberry cannoli pancakes, and he's eating a burrito the size of an RPG. He leans over the table, and he says to me, Joe, I'd like you to speak at one of my groups. I said, sure, Father, and I didn't think much of it after that. And it wasn't until a month later when Paige Berry calls me up and said, Joe, I understand you're speaking at a blaze. A blaze? Isn't that that big thing? Yeah. What am I talking about? She says, you're talking about sin, overcoming sin. How would you like to be thought of as the face of sin <laughs> in St. Monica's Paris? Either that or I'm thought of as the saint who overcame sin. <laughs> but as many of you know, if you've ever given a talk, there's three talks you usually give, the one you prepare, the one you give, and when you get home, the one you wish you had given. So let's put Joe out of the way here now, and I've got a quick prayer that I like to say, and I have some friends of mine here that are probably very familiar with this prayer, and I want to thank you guys for all the good work you do in our community too. So let's pray this, if you don't mind. God, I offer myself to you to build me and do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage yourself that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties so that victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. Let's get started to the real story. My name is Joe, and I'm a recovering al alcoholic and drug addict. And I thank God every day for my recovery from addiction. It's a blessing, and it saved my life. Not only my personal life and my physical life, but it saved my emotional life. Uh, it saved my spiritual life. It brought me back to life and a life that I cannot ever explain to you or give uh, credit to the good Lord and his mercy for bringing me to where I am today. If I get a little bit emotional, this does stir up emotions. I used to do this talk quite a bit, um, and I uh, haven't done it in a while, so it's kind of emotional. But uh, this is an extremely insidious disease that kills, uh, that kills the soul, that kills marriages, that ruins jobs, that breaks up homes. Uh, you, you, I'm sure everyone here, or a lot of you here, are probably familiar with someone who may have some kind of a disease, some kind of an addiction, and it not only manifests itself in drugs, alcohol, but it could be anything. As a matter of fact, there's even a Joggers Anonymous, if you believe that one. Uh, there are people that get addicted to jogging and consumes their life. Uh, many folks have a preconceived in an alcoholic as an addict, as maybe you think of the, as a, of the guy who's walking down Buford Highway or the lady with the shattered clothes and the unshaven, maybe a brown bag that he's got a bottle of alcohol or his drugs in, and he's just walking down the street lost. Well, that's true in, in some cases, a very small ca amount of cases. But this disease, and I call it a disease, it's a dis-ease, okay, um, affects everybody. doesn't make any difference if you're a man, you're a woman, you're rich, you're poor, you're powerful, you don't have any powerful, uh, have money, makes no difference, crawls all lines. Um, and it's, it's, it's truly insidious. Now... Let me explain to you, in my case, when I was at the height of my disease in the mid-80s, you looked at my life and you said, man, this guy's got his stuff together. You know, he's he dressed nice, he's a manager of a large car dealership, matter of fact, one of the ten largest in the United States. I was about to be made the general sale, sales manager, because I was good at what I did, because I was addicted to it. I loved it. It consumed my life. You know, that's all I thought about. Sin. Let's get to the def definition of addiction. Addiction is, is defined as an obsession of the mind and allergy of the body. Let, let me see if I can explain that for you. If you. When you were young, you remember your first bow? I remember mine, poor Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda did all right. She married the guy who ended up starting starter sports, so I guess she didn't need me. But um, I, you know, from the moment I woke up in the morning to the time I went to bed, I, I thought about Rhonda. You know what I mean? Like, should I call her up? Should I call her girlfriend? Will she go out with me? Which, does she like me? You know, I was a completely obsessed. 
When I was obs obsessed with addiction, it was the same thing. I would wake up in the morning and I would think, okay, where am I going to get the money to buy the drugs? How am I going to get my drug dealer up? Because they deal all night long and, and, and they go to sleep about six or seven in the morning. So I had to wake him up to get him up. Uh, when I went to work, who was I going to go to lunch with? And when I went to lunch, was I going to have one beer or maybe a couple of gl glasses of wine with, with, uh, with everything else I was doing? Did I have my Halcyon with me? My Halcyon pill, so in case I got too high during the day, you know, was I going to come, was it, this was the drug that would br bring me down and, and ease it out and kind of even out the addiction and the disease. Uh, it was early a.m. on Good, Good Friday in 1987, April 17th, 1987. I had had a small party at my home with a couple of lady friends of mine. I knew them, good friends of mine. I knew them about an hour and a half. They, uh, <laughs> they left. They were gone with all my money. Uh, the bottle of booze was gone. The bag of dope was empty. The front, most frightening feeling that ever hit me hit me. I was sober as a judge. And what flashed in my mind was I had been in a recovery center a year before that. And what flashed in my mind was there's three choices we have when we're, in a di we're an addict or an al alcoholic. Number one, jails. I had been thrown in jail a couple of times for drunk driving. One time I was thrown in jail for my own protection. How I got there, I don't know. I don't remember the night before. I was in a blackout for 12 hours. Okay. Check jails. Institutions. A year before this, I had been in a 28-day program, which I didn't take serious. I was doing it for everybody else to make everybody else happy. Okay. Check institutions. Choice three, death. I didn't want to die. Those are your three choices. So if you know somebody and they need help, try to get them help. This disease will manifest itself in a lot of ways. You'll see people, they died of a heart attack. They died of cirrhosis of the liver. Um, uh, uh, whatever the case may be, that's not what really happened to him. We know what really happened to him. So be careful. Be leery of that. How my disease started was, I'll tell you this, I was flunking a physics test when I was in college. And I went to a fraternity brother named Moon. Moon had a big round face, as you could probably figure out. And Moon was the, was the guy. You know how you have somebody in college that you always go to if you're in trouble? So I went to Moon. I said, Moon, what am I going to do? He said, Joe, no problem. He says, let me give you this little pill. So he gives me this black pill. He says, go, find, go into a study hall, get the physics book, take the pill with a cup of coffee, you'll be fine. What? Okay, I have nothing else to lose. I took the pill, got the cup of coffee, went into the study hall, read the physics book, learned the physics book. 93 I got on the final. I ended up getting a C in the course. Goes to show you how badly I was flunking the course. They call that drug today Adderall. So if any of you, I'm sure there's a lot of you here that are familiar with that drug, be very, very careful. If you have ch children who use that for whatever the reason is, please monitor the prescriptions. Um, you know, I remember in the Mass, I love the Mass, and there's a couple of parts in the Mass uh, that, that, that strike home with me. One of them is when Father lifts his hands, he says, lift your, lift your hearts up to the Lord, and we all lift our hearts up to the Lord. Raise our hands in glory. And I, and I smile to myself because <laughs> Father Jack did a great homily on this. We're not lifting our hearts to the Lord because we're giving them some great gift. We're lifting our hearts to the Lord because we're in sin. They're hardened, darkened, diseased, sinful. We want to give, here, take this heart from me and give me a new one. You know, I remember what I was saying on that couch that night. I cried out for God, all I want in my life is some peace and serenity. That's what's done to me. When I hear that in the Mass, that flashes back to that night, and that keeps me on the right track. Right after that, we say, God, I am not worried that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Simply put, we're just sick. Sin. What is sin? There you go. Sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It is failure in genuine love for God and neighbor, caused by a perverse, a perverse attachment to certain goods. Kind of sound familiar? Okay. Maybe you got, thank you, maybe you got some kind of a sin that's, that's weighing on your mind, weighing on your mind. Please do something about it. Let's, and how is it 
what do we do and what steps can we take to get rid of this sin or get rid of anything if it's bothering you. For instance, it's great about the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a, um, my first therapist in recovery was a recovering priest and he always told me the only mention of alcohol is in the 12 steps. Everything else is about God. But what I do today is the most important thing is to be completely honest. When I was getting sober, uh, I remember meeting with a sponsor and he told me, he said, Joe, there's only one thing you got to change. I said, sure, what's that? That was easy. He said, everything. <laughs> I had to change my whole life. Well, I didn't like that. You got to change uh, where your job, and I, and, and I left my job, uh, by, by the way. I left my job. I uh, uh, had to start going to different places. I'd go to two or three AA meetings a day. You know, I, I immersed myself in it. And today, when, when things come up in my life, uh, you know, like sin, I immerse myself here at the church. I try to get up in the morning. First thing I do is go to Mass. Because he told me, he said, you know, when you, when you go to bed at night, I want you to take your shoes and throw them underneath the bed. And I said, what does that have to do with anything? He says, because when you get up in the morning, I want you hitting your knees and thanking God for your life and your sobriety that day. You know, that was really, really, I still think of that every day. Um, and, you know, I had something like that about uh, back in June. And um, I, I, was, I was dealing with, with I, was in a, I was in a lukewarm position in, in my spiritual life. And I went to Father Jack. I said, what, what do you think I should do? So he gave me a book, uh, suggested I get a book by Father Jacques Philippe. By the way, he's going to be doing a mission here soon. So please go to that. He's great. A small book, about 100 pages, if you ever want to, want to read. It's called Walking with God. And I read that, and he said, now go on, go on a retreat. And I went on a silent retreat, and I went with a spiritual advisor. And we just shared some of our deep-down thoughts and, and things that bother us. And I told him some of the things, some of, my, some of my heart and sins, and he shared with me some of his. And, um, and then right after that, I did a general confession. Uh, with a priest. General confession go all the way back and uh, it's not that you have to explain every sin. It's just uh, there's three roots of sin. Pride, vanity, and lust. And if you take those three and you look at those three, all your sins will fall into, the, into, the, into one of those areas. Hope. How do we get hope? How do we get hope in the church? Okay, and you know, I get a lot of hope from the saints. I don't know about you, but I read about guys like Abraham. Abraham was 90 years old, had, hold these ho had all this hope all these years to have a son and could never have a son. God said to him, you're going to have a son. How can I have a son? I'm 90 years old. But he believed and he had faith. Okay, has a son. Not only that, God comes back to him later on and says, I'm, I, want to, I want you to kill your son. Kill my son, but he believes that some good will come out of this and he obeys God and we all know what happened. God saves him and his son and that doesn't happen. Peter, what a loser he was, huh? He couldn't even fish, the guy. Um, <laughs> I think about it. You know, he denies Christ three, three times. And Christ says, get behind me, Satan. He's our first pope. I mean, if these guys can get sober, anybody can get sober. St. Maria Goretti, you know, as she's being stabbed by Alessandro, she's not worried about it. She's a girl's 12 and a half years old. You know, and she's not worried about herself. She's worried about, more, about poor Alessandro. And she says to him, Alessandro, Alessandro, you're killing your soul, you know, while she's, while she's dying. You know what? I mean, I get the chills when I think about that. But I, but I love David. David. David was a stud. What, wasn't he? Sharp guy, good looking, had all the looks, had the power, was a great warrior, kills Goliath. Uh, but boy, did he commit a sin. He lusts for Bathsheba. And now in order to get Bathsheba, he kills her husband, Uriah. Her, Uriah was one of his best warriors. Uriah was one of his best warriors, and uh, he, has, he has him slain, and, and, he, and he tries to make up that, for that all his life. My psalm that I say every day before confession, after confession, after I receive communion, most of the time, I wish I could uh, be, be dishonest if I say I do it all the time, is Psalm 51. In that psalm, we hear that every day. It's said millions of times a day in every mass throughout the world. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Huh? Is that powerful? That's David. We're born, we're in the line of David, every single one of us here. Jesus Christ was born in the line of David. These are the people. When Father Jack says to us, Jesus Christ lives with the sinners in the midst of the sinners, he really does. You know where I get comfort? I get really comfort. My safest place is when I'm in an AA meeting because I'm in, a bunch, I'm in the middle of a bunch of sinners. You know, people who have, 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 have hurt their lives in one way or another. 
that are honestly trying to change their lives and do change their lives. I see miracles every day. I know there's miracles in this room. You know, I know who you are. You know who I am too, right? Okay. And second of all, uh, it's not second of all, but we need to clean house. Clean house is nothing that more than doing a fearless, thorough, and moral inventory. When things are bothering us, and I have people come up to me and say, you know something, you might offend people or, or, or maybe you'll say things that hurt people. Well, when I'm doing that, that's good. That's good. I want to stir it up in people because they're hiding some, some part of their lives that they're afraid to get out. Get it out. Write it down. Put it on a piece of paper. Find somebody you trust. Release it. We're blessed here. We got confession. Not only can we get that relief, that personal human relief, but we can get relief from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know, he will take all our sins away. They're done. Once we're in that confession, the Father says, you're relieved, of, cleansed of your sin. You're cleansed of your sins. Okay? I remember when I did my, my, uh, my uh, talk, my inventory talk with my sponsor out in the Bay Area. And uh, it was in November, and that's the rainy season out there. And I had done, it took me like three or four hours to go through this. I would, I went through my whole life and, and I cried and I told him what sins I had committed while I was, while I was under the influence. There was a lot of them. Um, and I walked into that rainy night and I felt that, that, that dew, that evening dew that night, uh, that mist coming across my face uh, in, in the, the cool weather. And I just stood there for like five minutes. And I let this rain hit my, hit my face and cleanse me. And I felt, wow, what a relief. This is awesome. You know, for the first time in my life, um, I feel clean. I feel cleansed. And that's the way I feel every day in confession. Yesterday before um, I came here, I, I went to confession with Father Jack. And, um, and, and we sat and we just chatted. And we talked about some of the sins I have. And he, gave me, he always gives me great ideas. Great, I, you know, we're so blessed to have a priest. You know, we truly, truly, and I don't say this. Um, I do say this with, 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 a, with a lot of uh, a meaning. We, we truly have the all-star priest, all-star team of priests here. Oh. Um, thank you. It's good to know that, that you all feel the same way I do. Uh, the, the way I stay clean and sober today is a lot of prayer and med meditation. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm here, I'm here a lot. Of course, I'm retired. I have the time to do it. But we all have the time to do it, and it doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, if you're driving by sometime, just stop in the Adoration Chapel. Spend a couple of minutes before Mass. Don't come right at Mass or after Mass. Come a couple of minutes early and get down on your knees. Hop in the, ch hop in the chapel. You know, uh, and, and people say, well, what do you do in the chapel? You just sit there for an hour. You know, St. John Vianney was asked one time, what do you do when you're in an Adoration Chapel? And he said, I look at him, and he looks at me. Bob Berry told me this one time. He says, Wait. he says, if you're ever in doubt, remember, you don't even remember this, do you, Bob? He said to me, I said, I, I, I don't know what to do when I'm in there. He goes, just look at the tabernacle and say, is that really you in there? You know, and I did start doing that, Bob. I don't know if I ever told you. Thanks for that. But I started getting some faith. If you start spending time in there, you will be amazed, amazed how your life changes. You know, it's, 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 it's a power power that, that, uh, that I can never explain to you. Uh, the great Roman philosopher Seneca once said, a busy man is busiest when at rest. Think about that. You will get the most uh, um, greatest lessons and greatest instruction of how to live life if you're just quiet and you listen. Shut up. Listen. Okay. I'm going to, do I have one story? 45 seconds. 45, okay. Well, sorry. Here's, here's a, when I first got sober, I was in an AA meeting, and somebody gave me this red book. It was, about a, it was written by a fellow by the name of Zig, Zig Ziglar. I don't know if anybody heard of him. He's a great salesperson. Zig's my man. So anyway, I, take, I didn't know who it was at the time. So I take it home, and I open it up to the story. And it's a story about a man at a desk with his little son who's playing on the floor. And um, the son tugs on his dad's pants. He says, Dad, can we go out and play now? And the, kid, and the father says, no, not right now. We've got to wait a few minutes. I'm busy. Five minutes later, um, the son comes back. His dad, can we play now? And the, the father looks over. And the son is playing with a page of, of the map of the world on it. And he takes the map of the world. He tears it up in a bunch of pieces. And he said, when you put the world back together, you and I can go play. So the kid said, OK. Five minutes later, he tugs on his pants. And he said, Dad, I'm ready. He said, you put the world back together already? He said, no, Dad, on the other side of the page, there was a picture of the man. 
I put the man back together. When I put the man back together, the world came together. Thank you very much. I can see you.